Would you please stand with me as we read from Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes and the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. And the church said, Amen. Yeah. You may be seated. <clears throat> We've been strategic over the last several years as a church to celebrate what the early church has called Advent. Advent essentially is a way for a church and for God's people to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. It usually fills the four Sundays preceding to Christmas Day, where for four Sundays the church would take time to celebrate this reality that God himself would come to live with and walk with his people. This year, we have focused on Emmanuel with us as our prophet, as our priest, and now this week as our king. Jesus is the perfect prophet, fulfilling the perfect speech of God. Not only proclaiming God's speech perfectly, as it was imperfect in the Old Testament when the prophets would preach, but also actually becoming the very word of God himself, the living word of God. For the priests, the priests would sacrifice on behalf of the people of Israel that they would be forgiven of their sins, their iniquity, and their transgressions would be lifted from them. As a priest, the priest was to be the mediator between God and the people. The priest would speak on behalf of the people. He would pray for the people. He would, in essence, forgive the people of their sins. In that, it was imperfect as well. The sacrifice had to continually be done. Year after year, time after time, it was not perfect, but was pointing towards the greater sacrifice which Jesus himself becomes. But also, in this, we come to recognize that Jesus is king. The three offices that Christ embodies perfectly, prophet, priest, and now this week, we'll be learning about him as our king. That Jesus came to rule, to be the perfect king, the king of kings. I don't know if you've ever really kind of thought about this, but there is something about having a perfect ruler. It's as if almost built within the DNA of mankind that we have for years, for decades, for all eternity, desired a perfect ruler, a perfect king, a, a perfect someone who would make the world right. In fact, if you remember, the people of Israel, they were, they were freed from the bondage of Pharaoh, right? God's chosen people enslaved, laboring, and working. And God sends Moses, not to be a king, but to just be a guy, an imperfect man at best, to lead God's people out of the, de out of the desert of Pharaoh's grip and, and into what would be the promised land. And if you remember in the story, it is God gives them this great grace of freedom, gives them manna from heaven, food that literally comes from heaven above to feed them. He provides for them perfectly. In fact, 
He, he provides a supernatural way during the day for the people to be led, and then a supernatural way for them to be led at night so that they always, if you will, had God before them, leading them and guiding them to this promised land. And as time progresses, you recognize, you realize that the people of Israel are not satisfied to have God necessarily just as their leader and as their king. They start to compare. They start to look at the people around them, recognizing that these nations who, who were far more powerful than Israel, right? We have to remember that Israel is and has always been a very small, insignificant group of people. They have not had great strength and great numbers. They've always had God at their back, though. And, and they looked around and they said, look at all these other powerful nations. Many of them had chariots. You see some of the writings of this in the Psalms where David talks about the power of chariots. It's, 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 it's if you will, an army with a tank and another army not having a tank. Right? If you have a tank and you go against an army who doesn't have a tank, there's a good chance you're going to win. Right? And so the people compared and they said, we desire a human king. Give us a king. And God essentially says, no, I'm your king. But the people continue to cry out for a king. And so God says, okay, I'll give you a king. And they end up with a king. And the very first king that they receive is King Saul. Not a great king. A mad king, if you will. We, we see the people calling out, we need a king. We need someone to see. We need someone to touch. We need to hear somebody. We, we need a position of power. And God essentially says, okay, I'm going to give you a king, but this king's going to have to lead you, and I'm going to remove some of my own leadership from you. There's going to be consequences to this decision that you're looking to a human to guide you rather than to God himself. Now, fast forward into our society today and the reality of our society today. I don't know if you remember not that long ago we had a... Uh, a really joy-filled time during the elections between the Democrats and the Republicans. I mean, just, I look back with just fond memories of just how unified we are as a nation. Well, well the reality is it's no different than the people of Israel. It's, it's, it's the United States of America crying out and declaring that if we get the right guy, if we get the right guy in office, we can pass the right laws and we can protect our nation. We can make sure that our kids will be safe in school, and we can make sure that they're being taught things that aren't necessarily anti-God. And then we can get the right people in the Supreme Court and, and make sure that, that the nation will be led well and our people will do well and that they'll thrive and do well. It, it's no different, to be honest with you, it's no different than the people of Israel looking for a man to do what a man can never do, calling out for someone to lead and guide. Again, I think this is, this is deeply built into the DNA of humanity. The great author J.R. Tolkien once said that within every great story is the gospel. Essentially what he said is any movie that you love, an epic film, an epic tale, any good book that you write, the reason it's epic to you, even if it isn't, isn't a Christian book, calls out to you because the gospel inevitably is within it, within it. I mean, think of how many movies that you have seen just maybe in the last six months where, where the hero of the story falls, maybe even dies, and then is resurrected again. I have not seen a Superman film where kryptonite has not crippled him, only for him to rise again. Or in Batman and the Dark Knight series where he goes to prison, only to rise again. J.R. Tolkien, in fact, if you read his books, you, you see that within his own books, there's, there's these, these people, the, the, the men of the world, and they're calling out for a king. Right? Who, who's the one who's going to rise up and lead men again? And the reason for it is why? Because there's another king. Inevitably, we know that, that there is a ruler in the world that is like a king. It's an evil king. It's a king that brings contention, a king that brings division, a king that is oppressive. Demonic is what the Bible calls it. It's Satan himself. And down deep, we see we need someone to rise up to defeat this king, to crush this king. Inevitably within us, we want a king. Now, the saddest part to this in all reality is not only do we want someone to look at, someone perfect, someone to guide us, someone to lead us, someone to free us from the oppression of the world, we also kind of, if we're really honest, we want to be king. There's no one better on the throne of the heart of self than self. I mean, think of it, if you, if you have ever met somebody with very strong political opinions, they will tell you there is a right way the nation should be lived 
in a wrong way, and they're pretty cocksure of it. Or we see this in marriage. To be the king of our own home, to have it led in a particular way, to make sure the wife loves us in a certain way or the husband loves us in a certain way. We, we want inevitably to be in control. This is the nature of sin itself. Yet over 300 times, prophecy tells us that there is going to come a better king. There's going to come a Messiah, one who will establish his throne and kingdom forever. Not a, not a king that will last for four years or maybe eight years, but a king that will last forever and a kingdom that will be established forever. I always kind of laugh when I hear people say, man, you know, the world is probably darker than it ever has been. Things are just so dark that, that I'm shocked. I am surprised. I'm dismayed even that Christ has not come back to redeem his people and to destroy this awful world we live in. Remember my comment on reading? This is where it's important to actually look at the kind of culture and society that the baby king, Jesus, was born into. He was born into the Roman Empire. One of the most vile, most disgusting, politically disoriented and twisted nations, countries, whatever you want to call it, I mean, very, very evil place. I would, I would almost argue if you read, read what happened in the Roman Empire, you could say that was the epitome of the darkest time, the darkest age. And yet, and yet we, we, we come to this place where, where Jesus is born in the midst of this vile, evil culture. The world isn't any more darker today than it was yesterday. The moment that the serpent came in the garden and deceived Adam and Eve and they fell in temptation, the world became dark. The world became dark. And we became children of darkness. And there's something in us that, that, that wants to run after that darkness. Every single one of us. Our world inevitably is ruled by a kind of king that needs to be usurped. And, and the people of Israel, one of the reasons many Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah is they, could, they believe that, that the Messiah would come as a ruling, reigning king, a warrior king. You see, living in the Roman Empire for a Jew was not a fun thing. They were ruled inevitably by Caesar. They, they were, in, a, in essence, told, you must look at Caesar as your God. You must worship him. This is why the, the Pharisees try to get Jesus to, to say things that would inevitably make it sound like Jesus was calling Caesar a false god so that they could kill him. And so the Messiah comes, he's born as a baby, he dies on a cross, and the, the many of the Jews, even today, they say, Jesus can't be the Messiah because the Messiah is going to come, and he's going to overthrow the rule of the Roman Empire. He's going to come with an army. He's going to come with a host of angels, which, which takes us back to, I don't know if you realize this, but we get a lot wrong as Christians at Christmas time. We get a lot long about Christmas. First of all, we make it all about presents. Uh, secondly, just uh, the nativity scene. Anyone have a nativity scene at home? So my wife took my kids out to Glenshire to take a look at what lights are out there at the houses and, and went with another family in the church. And she said, Jesse, we came across a nativity scene. Maybe you've seen it. She said, you know, in the nativity scene, there's the shepherds, there's the magi, there's Joseph, there's Mary, there's the sheep. And she said, and, and Santa was there too. <laughs> Saint Nick wasn't there, guys. I don't want to burst your bubble. I know there's some kids in here this morning. Saint Nick was not at the nativity scene. <laughs> the Magi weren't there either. The, it, the Magi, what's interesting about the Magi is the Magi actually came from the heritage of Daniel. When Daniel became in charge of all of the king's Magi wise men, he trained them. They were secular men. They weren't Jews. They, they were not Jewish people looking for the star who knew the Jewish nature. No, no, no. They were, they were trained by the Jew Daniel who knew the prophecies of a coming Messiah, and he passed down within a pagan culture of worshiping stars that if you look for this one star, it's going to appear, and it's going to be the Messiah. It's going to be God, the one and true God. And so here you've got these pagan men who are a year out. So if you, if you really want your nativity scene to be biblically accurate, set up your nativity in your house, go over to your neighbor's house and ask to put the magi in their home. 
And then a year later, go get them. <laughs> Tell them Jesus is here. I mean, that, I mean we, we, we romanticize these things, but these men were looking, waiting. They saw the star, and they were, they were pagan men. They were men initially who, who, again, they didn't follow the rules of Judaism. What's beautiful about the Magi is that they weren't Christians to begin with. They see the sign, and the first converts, if you will, who come to worship, as the text tells us, are people who don't really even know who Yahweh is. So God now, all of a sudden, from day one, Christmas reminds us that the message isn't, it isn't just for those who've always known. It's for those who've never known. And the gospel is opened up to these wise men for the first time, and they get to see, they get to see this one-year-old baby boy. And what's amazing is they knew, because Daniel, Daniel taught them. Now this is, some of this is a lot of its assumption, but the, the Daniel passed this on, and they come and they say, where is the king of the Jews? This is language for, where is God? Because the Jews had really only one real king. And it was God himself. They're in essence, where's God? Where is he? Because we've come to make him our God. We've come to make him our Lord and our king. Where is he that we may worship him? And of course, they find him. And what do they find? They find what prophecy in the Old Testament has explained to us time and time again. Not, not a king, not a God with a sword in his hand. Not a God who's come to overthrow the Roman Empire but a humble, little, baby boy. At some point, friends, we have, to ask the, uh, we have to ask the question, why is it that God would come to rule in such a way as a baby? He can't even talk. I mean, if we're to rule, if we're to reign, if you think about it, we would say, give us, and even the people of Israel, when they chose Saul, they chose Saul because he was tall, dark, and handsome. You don't believe me? That's what the text says. Which is always like super, like makes me really like subconscious. Not tall, <laughs> not dark, not handsome. Just another Lord of the Rings character. <laughs> he can't even speak. The baby boy can't, can't utter anything. He can't proclaim who he is. He can't give them a bunch of rules to follow. No, he's a baby. And the reason for that is because he comes as a king that's approachable. You know, if you go to the White House today, there's a good chance you're just not going to go knock on the front door. If you go to any other nation to go to speak to its political leader or its king or its president, you're not going to just go knock on the front door. And yet we have Jesus. He's completely accessible to all. It's to show us the non-threatening nature of God. It's to literally show us that grace has been, been, has been bundled up that anyone can come to him. That's what Christmas ultimately reminds us of. That we have a God who has not come to condemn. We don't have a God who's come to point his finger at us and to tell us just how sinful we really are. And there's a sadness to that. That the church has made, by and large, the Christian message just about how sin-filled you are. And you are. But that's not just it. It's that he's also come that any sinner, any person can come. He's come humbly. We celebrate the reality that our king is approachable. Our king is accessible. I was over at the Osnes' house the other day, and they took their youngest. And uh, Laura got up. She had to go do something, and she didn't even ask me. She just got up and gave me the baby and then walked into the back, which to me was a beautiful thing. First of all, like, you know, we're close enough where they feel safe enough to hand me their beautiful baby boy without even asking, you know? Like, normally, like, you want to hold my kid? And a lot, of, a lot of guys are like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> Talking to men over the years, going into the delivery room. You know, you going to be in there, man? You going to watch? No, <laughs> I'll be in there, but I am not watching. <laughs> Just something fearful. As I held him, he, I think it's because, if you don't know Zach, Zach's up here. Zach and I have a similar look. He just has more hair up top, but same red beard, and he is taller. More height jokes. 
And I think their baby boy just, you know, he sees the red beard and it looks familiar and cuddly and he reaches for my beard and he grabs my face and he has just the most beautiful, precious smile. Think of that for a moment. That Mary sat in a room with a beautiful little baby boy with an innocent little smile and she was holding God in her hands. The approachableness of Christ. See, what makes Christianity so unique is that there is no way for you to possibly get into a relationship with this King of Kings. You you cannot work for it. You cannot earn it. Every religion teaches that what you must do, what must be done to get right with the maker of the heavens and the earth. Or, or how to do a certain thing to be in relationship with one of the many gods in the world. We don't believe any of those things. We believe that God has done exactly what was necessary for man to be saved. See, Christians have no place to boast. We, we, we should be the least arrogant of all people. Because we've done absolutely nothing to get into relationship with Jesus Christ. We've done nothing to call God our God. That we would become his children. That we would become his people that he would become our king of an everlasting kingdom. We've done absolutely nothing to get those things, to inherit those things. It's been all 100% work of God. God sends his only son, who lives a perfect life on our behalf, who then dies on the cross on behalf of our sins and transfers to us his righteousness. He gives it to us as a gift. You're not perfect, here's my perfection. You're imperfect, I'll take your imperfection. And he dies the death that is necessary. And then just to make sure everybody knows this kingdom does live forever, he rises from the grave. That he and he alone has the keys to death. You've done nothing. And the reality of Christmas, again, is that we're reminded that we've done nothing to get our salvation. Therefore, we can do absolutely nothing to lose it. See, the reality of this kind of king is, is the kind of kingdom that we have as Christians is a kingdom where God removes from us our guilt and condemnation. You know, we live in a society that is driven by guilt. You may or may not know this. Much of how our, our culture works to get you to fit in, to get you to keep, you know, making that widget and producing more money for a bigger company or doing whatever, a lot of it's guilt. It's what drives us. If I don't do these things, I'll feel guilty. How many of you have asked your spouse, are you doing okay? Just because you have a sense that maybe you did something wrong. Are we good? There's this thing in our culture that, that rules over us that, that if you, in order to keep you performing, just a little bit of guilt hanging over your head. And yet we have a king that came in his kingdom to remove from you your guilt and your condemnation. And scripture says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I mean, if, if you really realize that, you recognize in the kingdom, you should smile more often. Right? Isn't Christmas supposed to be the most joy-filled time of the year? And for many of us, it isn't. Man, it is tiring. I got to shop. I got to prepare a meal. I don't have to prepare a meal. I've never prepared a meal. But someone else has prepared a meal. Hypothetically for someone else. And yet it's It's stressful. Ministry, ministry, man, of, like in ministry, for those of us who are pastors and elders in the room, you know, like this, this is a busy time of year. I'll preach two times today, two times tomorrow, and have Christmas Day with my kids the following day. At some point, I'll recover in 2019. Not exactly sure when. Probably be February. It can be a hard time. And we recognize that sometimes, sometimes the holidays have a way of producing within us not necessarily the joy that we want to experience, but a reminder of how hard life can be. Many of us in the room, it's a reminder that a loved one isn't here anymore or struggling through sickness or, or struggling through financial hardship. I want to give my kids what, I, what they want, but I, I can't. And then there's the guilt again. I had a conversation with my wife this week. I never thought I would have. She says to me, we have to convince Jolie of something. I said, what do we have? This is our four-year-old daughter. My four-year-old daughter for Christmas asked for a Barbie uh, dollhouse, which is kind of weird for me to just talk about, right? I'm going to buy a dollhouse? 
she doesn't need it, right? I was like, she doesn't need it. And then, and then my wife said, well, this is how much it costs. It was like 200 bucks. I was like, what? Barbie's living larger than I am. We're not getting the dollhouse. It's, it's too expensive. And so, and so we, as we did some research, we came across Kids Craft makes the dollhouse. It's like half the price, I, except for dad has to put it together. And, uh, and so, <laughs> which was a whole other conversation. <laughs> Give it to her in the box. You've got to put it together. I don't want to put it together. And, uh, and so, so she says, you know, we got to make sure that, you know, we sell her on this reality that the kids craft one is better than the Barbie one. And I'm like, if my daughter knows there's a difference between the kids craft dollhouse and the Barbie dollhouse, I have failed as a parent. <laughs> That's how I feel. Like, I'm just being honest with you. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, I, I want, but at the same time, you feel it. Like, I want my kids to have what they, I want to give them joy on that day. And all of us probably have some kind of memory of where we asked our parent for something, and we got something else. And some of you who are kids in the room right now, you're thinking, I better, I hope I get this thing. Right? You ask for an iPad, and you get a Kindle Fire. You're like, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Paperweight? Well, like there's, it, within Christmas, we've bundled up guilt and condemnation and performance. That we have to perform. And, and, and there's this weird thing. Have you ever realized even when we think about gift giving, it's like, like you know, we, we, someone says, you want me to get you a gift this year? No, man, don't get me a gift. Like, no, seriously, don't get me a gift. And then inevitably, what do they do? Man, you got me a gift. Now I got to give you a gift, <laughs> right? It's almost like the concept of grace just doesn't exist. Here's a gift for you. Receive it freely and be free of all guilt and condemnation. We can't do it. Oh, my gosh. They got me a card. I didn't get them a card. We had a conversation this year about how many pictures of our family we sent out to people. Not everyone's getting a picture of us, my wife said. Boy, how disappointed they will be. <laughs> It's just filled with these anxieties that we forget. We forget the purpose of the kingdom is not to be self-serving. See, when Jesus came to be king, he didn't come to rule over the world the way that we think we want him to. He came to rule over your heart. You see, sometimes we make even Christianity about this big, dark, evil king that is Satan and to overcome Satan. And you know what? He needs to be overthrown. There's no doubt. But here's the ultimate reality of that. He's already been dealt with. The death blow has been given to Satan. Do you know what still rules and reigns in your own heart? Self. You. The bigger enemy at times for us as Christians, it isn't the devil. It's, it's our desire to want to be number one. It's our desire to want to be our own God, to have life in our own way. And so Jesus comes literally... It comes from above, not to deal with all of the big stuff that we think is big, but to deal with the little thing that, you, that is much bigger than you think it is. Your natural tendency to be number one in the world. Isn't it true? I just want life to be about me. All you have to do is get on a freeway for a little while to realize that the fast lane belongs to one person, me. Everybody get out of the way. And then when someone passes you on the, on the right, what? I'm going 80. What are they doing? Don't they know in my kingdom you don't pass on the right? In my kingdom, I have the fast lane. All semis shall move over. Thus saith Jesse. <laughs> so God comes as a king to overthrow the kingdom of selfishness. That kingdom of selfishness and the kingdom of self leads to depression. It leads to anxiety. It leads to a fractured culture. You see, if you study Christianity, something that you will find is that Christianity never, and this, I promise you this, has never thrived when it has been placed in power. Christianity has never done well. It's grown toxic. If you remember, eventually this baby this little king born in a little trough, a little throne of hay. He'll grow up. 
And as he's walking with his disciples, you remember uh, the Last Supper, he takes off what would, in essence, would label him as a leader, label him as someone to look at, label him as, as someone that should be seen as king. He takes off his, his garb, his rabbi clothing. And he reaches over and he takes upon himself a rag, a rag that was literally set aside for slaves and slaves alone. And he clothes himself in the rags of slavery. And then he bows down on his knees into a wash basin and performs, again, another act that is reserved for slaves, those who were owned, not, not for a king, not, not for a messiah, not for a leader, definitely not a rabbi. This is, this is a slave's job, and he washes his disciples' feet. Upon washing the feet, he stands and he tells his disciples, I've done this to give you an example of how this should be done. In essence, he's saying, if you want to change the world, you do it through service. You do it by getting on your hands and knees and you wash people's feet. And the next question we say, well, well, you know, I like washing people's feet as long as, you know, they're good looking. As long as they're performing. Do you know who was in the group of those disciples whose feet were washed? Judas. The betrayer. The one we're literally told in the text that Satan has entered into Judas himself, that Judas would betray the Messiah for 30 pieces of silver, that the Messiah then would die. You'd be arrested. Jesus treats his enemy the same. He treats his enemies the exact same as he treats his disciples. This is the backbone of Christianity. This is the backbone of what we exist for, that we love people who are for God and we love people who are not for God. Yeah, but don't you know how, how, how anti-biblical they are? Don't you know the kind of truth? I, it doesn't matter. Sometimes people will come to me. I, I read an article tying into that statement there that people were coming to me that the title of the article was these kind of things catch my attention as a pastor. The, one of this is it said the most damaging thing in Christian churches. The premise of the article was was basically if you want to destroy a church, here's how you do it. And so I was really interested. Well, I don't want to destroy a church. How do I avoid this? I'll read the article. It was very eye catching for me. And upon reading it, the premise of the article was the most damaging thing in the church was for Christians to come into church, people just like you and just like me, and being critical of the church. Walking in and saying things like, well, you know, that was a great sermon, but it would have been better if you would have said this. Well, it's an okay church, you know, if they just did a little bit more outreach. Well, that was an all right message. He should have brought that Bible passage up, though. That child dedication was a little weird. Why do they do communion the way they do it? You know, the Sunday program over there with the kids, it's good, but it could be better. What is up with this new check-in system? Why do I need a sticker? <laughs> Just being critical. Because criticalness is the opposite of gratefulness. Christmas is a time to be grateful that Jesus would come at all to intervene on our behalf. What we need is gratitude. Like, God, thank you that we live in a culture that allows us to worship together in a room at all. Back to the Roman Empire, you, you worship God? Well, let's put you in the middle of a stadium so people can be entertained and watch you get eaten by a lion. Thank you, God, that we have the freedom to worship Christ. Thank you, Lord, that, that we have a, a pastor, not just a pastor, we have several pastors, several elders who are dedicated to teaching the Word of God in its entirety. Thank you, Lord, that we have men and women who serve. Thank you that we've got a group of people over there who are loving your kids so you don't have to be as distracted as you would be if they were in the room. Just gratitude to the reality that his kingdom is not about you. It's about other people. You might be sitting here and saying to yourself, There's, I'm getting absolutely nothing out of this message. That does not mean that the person next to you is not going to walk away and go, that was the most incredible thing I've ever heard in my entire life which several people said to me after the first service. That was incredible. Thank you. See, Christmas, as Jesus being our king, is a reminder that he's a better king. He's better than any president we've ever had. He's better than any king that existed in the Old Testament. He's better than any politician that you have ever voted for. None of those men are your savior. 
None of those men have the power or the ability to change people's hearts. You want to change culture, the only way to do it is to change the human heart. And the only one who has the ability to change the human heart is this approachable, grace-filled baby Jesus. So what should our response be to this kingdom? He's a different kind of king with a different kind of kingdom. In his kingdom, he overcomes physical sickness. Amen to that? Told the first service, there's a few people who are, there's a storm coming. How do you know? I feel it in my knees. My knees hurt. It's going to be good snowfall. I feel it in my knees. I feel it in my back. I feel it in my guts. I feel it in my bones. And then we're reminded that Jesus has come to give you a new body and that broken body you have. We say, thank you, God. I can't wait. It's a kingdom that brings resurrection. It's a kingdom that gets rid of addiction and brings real deliverance. It's a kingdom that brings true conversion to people's hearts. A true kingdom that frees us from condemnation, that gives us the forgiveness that we need. Frees us from operating out of guilt and instead operating out of true worship. It's a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. And it's a kingdom that when you absorb it completely, gives you purpose to life. I mean, one thing I get to honestly feel at the end of the day is for the most part, everything I do will echo in eternity. And as Christians, I mean, I was talking to this with John Drollinger. I don't know how many of you know John, but he's a graduate of Master's College. He thought he was going to be a pastor. We were at a Christmas party with him last night. He's a well-educated guy. Thought he was going to go into the ministry. And at a certain point in his relationship with his wife and having kids, he said, you know what God just called me to be? I guess he said, you know, God just called me to be a lay person. And that guy, he teaches next door. He's got a tremendous library and knowledge that he uses for the kingdom of God. And I thought to myself, I thought to myself, man, first of all, well, it's kind of a bummer that he said, I'm just a lay person. Because you in this room have more power and ability than I have to actually share the gospel with people and to love people. I, you come into the room, it's great. I get to have you once a week. Some of you work with people every single day. And sometimes we have to realize that in converting people's souls, because the ta- part of the takeaway this morning, I'm already kind of jumping there, part of the takeaway of, okay, how do we respond to Jesus as king? How do we respond to the fact that he's this approachable God who gives us salvation, who keeps our salvation? What should my reaction be? Part of the reaction should be that you share this good news with as many people as possible. That there's a better king. Because you care for those people. We have some neighbors across the way from our house. My kids have become friends with their two little girls. And uh, my, my uh, youngest little girl, Jolie, she's four. She hangs out with another little go- girl that lives next door, same age as her. And they're just the cutest little things. They, they come into the house and they'll, they just start singing their little songs. And, you know, I mean, they're cute. They don't sing well, but they're cute. It's just something precious about it, you know. And then they have one the same age as Peyton. Peyton's eight years old. And uh, he, he's, he had been inviting her to Iwana for a couple months, and she wouldn't go. And now she started going. She's been going consistently. And this little girl, not a Christian home, not a Christian family, she comes over from across the street on a weekly basis with Peyton and my wife to do biblical memorization for her Iwana verses. She loves it. And then she, we got a text message from her mom couple weeks ago. Her mom said, hey, my daughter wants to get baptized. Do you do that over there? Said, no, we don't believe in baptism. <laughs> I didn't say that. We went through a conversation, realized maybe now is not the, the right time. But, but we're sharing our faith with, with them. Like as your pastor, I'm, I'm practicing those things because I genuinely believe One, that they're important to God. Two, I really love them. Three, if that's true, I have to share with them the goodness that this king has come. I have to do it. I have no choice. Everything hinges on this. Why would I want to sit in my deathbed so many years from now and go, I wasted my life on materialism, on popularity, on money, on cars, on living for me? It's a huge fear of mine. And to some degree, 
I will have failed because I still have sin that exists within me. And then that's when I look back at God and say, thank you that you don't hold those things against me. See, the motivator for all these good gifts is grace. So the response should be share your faith. And you know what? You've got time. I, I, hopefully your Christmas shopping is done. And now you have all kinds of time to invite people to church. And you're not. Let's be clear. You're not inviting people to church. You're inviting them into a relationship with the one who created the galaxies. You're inviting them into an intimate walk with the God of the universe. Oh, that's what we want to be about. That's what we want for our people. It's what we want for ourselves. And then lastly, you should pray thy kingdom come. It's in the Lord's Prayer. Oh, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're praying, have your way, God. Well, what if, what if we didn't complain and we were filled with gratitude? And, and instead, we, we honestly just believe that, that we can pray about something and God will actually do it. Sometimes when people come to me with their complaints, they go, well, I think you should do it this way. I sometimes want to say, how long have you been praying about this before you came and talked to me? Because there's a good chance if you spent a couple months in prayer about it, God would actually handle it and you wouldn't have to say a word. But the reality is, well, in my kingdom, I like to act. I need, give me something to do. I want to be a warrior for God. Then pray. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. We said, Lord, Lord, I really want our pastor to preach the gospel in a way that is clear and concise. If he could just shorten his messages a little bit, pray. Pray. There are miracles. Pray. Lord, if more people would get saved at SBC, pray. If we'd see more baptisms, pray. If we would focus more on these things, pray. And then allow the King of Kings to mold and shape your heart because your particular desire of what you may want in the church might be wrong. Did you know that's possible for you to be wrong? I know no one's wrong in the United States of America. Everybody's right. Or everybody's wrong. <laughs> We're like the least teachable people in the world. Pray and share your faith and truly allow God to be the king that he is. Get off of the throne of your own heart and let a better ruler sit upon that throne. Amen? Amen. I have a little video that will show you that uh, kind of just summarizes what we talked about here this morning and then we'll sing. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that you are a better king. We pray, Lord, that you would put upon our hearts those that you want us to invite for tomorrow. But more than anything, Lord, that we would pray for you to accomplish the impossible task of men, women, young, old, and children all alike, Lord, for them to be born again. We trust you for that work, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.